Welcome to season two, episode 10 of Open Educator, the best place to be on a Tuesday morning. First, I would like to say thank you for joining us and taking that first step to grow personally and professionally. And for those here with a camera, I would encourage you to turn that on and to listen intently. The USF Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program prepares students in three main ways. One, of course, to build a business and to scale it, the traditional view of entrepreneurship. But the view of entrepreneurship has changed and grown and expanded. And we also develop students to two, develop and become product managers and develop and be innovators within a firm such as Google, Apple, Amazon, and Facebook. And we have 15 or more students that I've had that work for these great companies. And lastly, we develop students to de define careers that they define themselves, to be their own masters of their universe, to create careers and paths that do not exist or haven't been thought up of yet. And we have many students doing just that. So this empowerment of creating a career, a life, a journey, uh, that's not defined by others, but that you define on your own terms. And our next guest is doing that. Our next guest is someone who bleeds the fast paced, competitive, high flying career of consulting. He has managed large projects all over the world and has tons of stories to tell and share. He's both a strategic thinker and a master of details. Our next guest will be sharing his experience as a consultant and what are the skills in order to break into and succeed in that profession. Please give a warm welcome to Managing Director at FTI Consulting, Michael Moore. We do this with sign language when we have our mics off, so <laughs> this is a round of applause for you. So Mike, first of all, thank you. thank you for joining us this morning. Where does this cast find you? And can you bring us up to speed on what you've been working on? Yeah, so uh, I'm based here in Chicago or a suburb outside of Chicago. Uh, for those that want to connect with me and learn more after this, feel free to look me up on LinkedIn under Mike uh, Moore. My last name is spelled M-O-H-R, not like the typical M-O-O-R-E. Um, but you could also find me at mike.moore at fticonsulting.com. Um, and feel free if, if after this anybody has any questions, I'm very passionate about helping and supporting others. And as we get into today's conversation, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but always willing to have conversations and help out as best I can. Because at one point, believe it or not, many years ago, I was in your position. And uh, as we get through today's conversation, you'll hear how I you know, evolved and, and got to where I'm at today. Great. So we have a I, you know, we, we've been framing consulting because my students do have to take a student consulting class and mm -hmm. we hear about these ideas of a consultant and we tend to make consultants in our society either as heroes or villains on TVs and TV shows. But can we demystify what a consultant is or what's it like to be a consultant? So could you maybe share a bit about and help us understand what it means to be a consultant? Is there a, a weekly or daily life that you can share in a couple of stories? Yeah, definitely. I, I think, you know, if, if I think back when I was, you know, at many of your guys' ages or, you know, points in your life, uh, I, I didn't know what the heck consulting was. And, and when I got into it, it was very uh, overwhelming because uh, I just, I, I wasn't used to that fast paced world. But, you know, you talk about heroes and villains and whatnot. And, I think at any company you go to, whether it's a company, it's it's a social group, it's it's a it's a church, whatever it is, you're going to always have good and bad, right? The prob the problem is, or the bad thing is, is that those that are the villains are typically the ones that get the most attention, unfortunately. Uh, so while you know I've come across people throughout my career that yes, would I ever work with again? Absolutely not, because I just don't think that their ethics and morals are absolutely there. Uh, but I can tell you that majority by far of the people that I've worked with in consulting have had good ethics and morals and are doing the right thing. And really what we want to do as consultants is we're passionate about problem solving. Actually, sometimes my wife even yells at me and she's like, dude, I just want you to listen. I don't want you to solve my problem. Right. Um, so, you know, the other thing is, is you have to be a great listener. Right. So, you know, what gets me out of bed every day is being able to go in and identify these problems with my clients and solve those problems uh, that they're having that one, they don't have the experience to, 
or two, they just don't have the number of resources to be able to solve that problem in an efficient and quick manner that you know the the executives or the board want to be able to see. Um, currently, I was just working for an offshore. Uh, one of the larger projects I was working on was an offshore oil and gas company. Uh, just did a small stint with a uh, um, onshore oil and gas company, uh, working on their supply chain. Uh, one of the companies I just uh, finished up at the end of last year, beginning of this year, was a, a major appliance company where they said, hey, we want you to come in and look at our entire supply chain operation from demand planning all the way down to the transportation of the product once it's off the manufacturing line out to the customer and then even the customer service side. Um, and where can we make improvements and efficiencies along the process? And so, you know, where my background sits is around the operations and supply chain specifically. Um, and that's really what I'm working on these days. And um, now that I'm not necessarily on a project, uh, I've been putting some proposals together for potential opportunities that we had. I actually have a call right after this with a, a large glass manufacturer uh, to help them with uh, uh, a, refer a furnace rebuild that they were doing that didn't go appropriately. So if I could just take a moment, I have students from my three classes, so they're all mm -hmm. uh, studying some form of entrepreneurship and innovation, but they might be working on different projects in the different courses. And you mentioned several things that I just want to connect the dots to our audience in case they haven't. One, what consultants do in this idea that a consult might be brought in because a firm might not have the capacity, the know-how, the knowledge, mm -hmm. the expertise, or some sort of... Um, capability internally to solve that problem. So what do they do? They may go outside of their traditional boundary of the firm and ask and ask a consultant or take bids from a consultant to help them solve this problem or invent a new product, et cetera, et cetera, or fix whatever they're, they're, the, the challenge that they're facing. Mm -hmm. And within our scalability class, we focus on this idea of tapping into external knowledge of the firm as a competitive advantage. And that this is a critical because a firm may not have only or all the smartest people working for them. We have these institutional silos. We have these maybe backwards processes or these legacy systems that constrain us within a firm. And therefore, we need to look outside for that new knowledge, for that new technology, for those who have those skills. So hopefully those students who are in the scalability class and are dealing with those innovation challenges can make, can make that connection. I also want to mention that Mike mentioned this idea of making proposals. We are doing that in our scalability class. We are doing that in our student consulting class. And mm -hmm. we have to do research. And we have to come up with a proposal for an idea to solve a certain problem while they can define themselves. So we can start seeing how the activities the behaviors, the exercises, the homework and assignments we're doing directly translates to a career, a job path, and, and in practice. And lastly, I want to highlight, which is sometimes the biggest challenge for my students, and I'm curious to know how you deal with this, Mike, is oftentimes we don't have all the knowledge about this company or about this industry, and we may not know anything about it, but we have to do research and we have mm -hmm. to get up to speed fast. So you yeah. talked about onshore oil and gas, offshore oil and gas. You talked about major appliances. Now you said a glass company. These are all different. Mm -hmm. And my students are expected to learn about a company or an industry, and they have to start from scratch. And I assume, how do you get your knowledge and know-how up to speed in order to be able to engage with these different industries so fast. Could you share, because we, we want to talk about research, but how do you do it? Yeah, so one of the first things when I find out that I want to be starting a project, um, the week before that project, I'm learning everything and anything I can about that industry. I can give you a couple examples. There's a there's a company called Exteron Energy down in Houston. Uh, they make oil pipelines, gas pipelines, could be natural gas, could be oil, whatever it is. Um, I had no idea what the heck they did, right? So I'm sitting there Googling and watching YouTube videos and how do you construct an oil pipeline or a gas pipeline? Uh, what is the terminology that is used? I remember when I was working for the offshore oil, oil and gas company up in Aberdeen, Scotland. Again, I was watching videos on the weekend to understand, 
know, how does a rig drill? What is a roughneck? What is the drill bits? What is the, you know, uh, drill stack? All of that good stuff. Um, so it's constantly researching through whether it's Google, YouTube. Um, a lot of times we have uh, industry capabilities with, uh, there's a company called Ibis World, I-B-I-S, and then World. And, you know, just for this last project that I was working on in glass manufacturing, I got an article, I got the download of the industry profile, which is like 50 pages. And I started skimming through that to really understand, okay, there's different types of glass. There's flat glass, there's container glass and all that other good stuff. And here's what's going on in the markets. What's the levers? What's the total cost of ownership? All of that. So that as I'm building this proposal or even having the calls with the client prior to the submittal of the proposal, I'm speaking their lingo and being able to look, be looked at as that um, expert, right? Now, at the end of the day, am I truly the one that's the expert in the industry? No, I've got folks that are on my team that are really the experts. But when it comes down to supply chain challenges, really doesn't matter if you go from a glass company to a auto manufacturer. Supply chain is pretty much supply chain. There might be some different nuances along the way. Um, but as long as you know the overall process, I can speak very knowledgeably to what are some of the challenges they're having, plus also having the partner with me that might know more about that industry specifically. And when we tag team that, you know, we come off very, very well to the client. It's like, wow, these guys really know what they're talking about. You know, we're sharing our videos. We come off empathetic um, and just, you know, good guys and gals that are willing to help solve their problem. I love hearing that one of the biggest challenges that I face as a faculty member is getting the students to do some proper research where they can at least have a comfort level where they can have some idea of what's going on in that context. Because I think you would agree, if you don't understand the environment, you don't understand that context, at least to a, a certain level, how could you mm -hmm. ever solve the challenges or the problems that these companies are facing? And while you do have experts on your team or people very knowledgeable, you have to be comfortable, like you said, with the language, understanding certain processes or a minimum level. And when mm -hmm. you mentioned the IBIS, well, I require all my students, at least for two of my classes, to go to the library, to meet with the librarian and to talk and go find journals, industry white papers and mm -hmm. industry uh, databases. So we can see why I have you do this because it directly translates to what we have to do in industry. So yeah. wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Um, if, if I can add one more thing too, just, you know, even on the selling side. So, you know, what I was talking about there was once we get to sale and we're about to start the project, you know, I remember years ago talking to a guy and they were thinking that I would be good in sales. And I said, no, 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 I'm not a sleazy sales guy. I don't do that stuff. Right. I'm just the implementer. I go and I deliver stuff. Right. Well, as my career has evolved, I realized that I have to do sales and even what I do is part of sales and you can talk to anybody out there that's been in sales for years before you have that first phone call with the client, you're doing a minimum of three hours of research. Um, that's what am I going to talk about? What's the script I'm writing out and I'm reviewing that script to make sure I'm fully prepared. You know, one of the things I do for a client, if I don't know any problems that they're having, or I don't have a good lead in, I'll go look at their financial statements. I'll look at their income uh, statement. I'll look at their balance sheet and I'll see, hey, what's going on? And through that analysis, I'll be able to find out, hey, look at their operating income. They're spending, you know, $1.25 on SG&A per every operating income dollar. Well, if, if you understand anything about what I just said, what that means is they're spending 25 cents over every dollar that they are getting in operating income, which means they're losing money big time or spending a hell of a lot more money in SG&A that they should. So I'll write that down. And so when I reach out to say that CFO or COO, I'll come to the table with the conversation starter to say, hey, tell me a little bit about this. I did some research. I understand you're paying $1.25 on every, you know, for SG&A on every operating income dollar. Why is that? Help me understand that a little bit more and how I might be able to help you. So that literally, you know, that takes two to three hours to pull all that information together and be able to come to the table and have some type of conversation that is within their wheelhouse or relevant to them. What I liked in that example, we teach design thinking as mm -hmm. part of the method for student consulting. But what you shared is also a form of needs analysis. Because of the research that you've done, 
this holistic approach, both the financial side, the database side, the industry side, and, and many other sides, you have mm -hmm. identified certain talking points, the script that you've talked about, this game plan that you have when you're meeting with the client prior, you, you, know, you prepared in advance, and, mm -hmm. then, and then you have this uh, questions which help you identify the needs analysis, which is very much and very similar to understanding your client and, and the empathetic part of the design thinking process that I, the students are expected to learn in that course. Mm -hmm. And I want to highlight and make this connection for the students as well. So Mike is a seasoned veteran. Mike has been doing this for decades, I assume. Yeah. And he says he does three hours of research per meet, before per meeting, and he writes out a script. So my students currently have to create videos because we primarily are online and they have to make presentations or pitches, et cetera. And they are encouraged to make scripts, to make a better seamless format. So we can start mm -hmm. seeing why they're doing this and how it translates to needs analysis, sales, communication, pitch, meeting, whatever the case may be. So I'm really happy that you've, you've shared that. Mm. I want to also dig into this idea of data and research. How important mm -hmm. is it for you? Because it can be daunting. There can be a lot of data. There can be misinformation data. How do we evaluate good data, combat bad data? Is there some rules of thumb that you have that you can inform us? Because we can't just be just picking everything off of Google or taking the, the local newspaper. Any wisdom or insights you have from that? Yeah, I, I would say that data and research is 80 to 90% of my job, um, if not more. I mean, if everything from the sales side to actually delivery. I remember we were talking about something, my wife and I, and she said, well, how do you know that? And I'm like, well, all I do is data analysis and research. And she's like, what do you mean? Don't you just go in and fix supply chain problems? I'm like, yes, I do. But let's take a very simple issue, inventory management, right? People think, oh, you just go into the warehouse, you look at the inventory and you figure out what the problem is. And it's like, yes, that's a part of it, but that's a small part of it. What I do is I look at the data to really tell me what the issues are, because in any project I'm performing, there's a beginning part of the project. That first week, you're having interviews with the stakeholders to understand how that process is performed at their business and the steps that they do to do that process. Well, now, if I look at the data, data doesn't lie. Numbers are numbers. Joe or Jane over here could tell me the story that's a little bit different than what the data is telling me. And I can know right, right then and there that they're not following the process, right? So that's how I use data in the researching of getting that data to be able to help me understand what the problem is and figure out how to solve it. Um, you know, in our industry, we always talk about analysis paralysis, right? So yes, there's a time and place that you need to step back and say, okay, I've done as much research as I can. I'm not coming up with what I need. I need to either shift gears to something else and maybe come back to it, or I need to start reaching out to other folks that might have more experience or expertise around this than I would. Um, my rule of thumb is, is if I can't find what I'm looking for within the first half hour, it's either probably not there, or I just don't know how to look for it. And I need to call somebody who's more experienced at this than me. Wonderful. And I, again, with your example that you shared, you talk about interviewing. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, I push the students in two of my classes to go interview people in the industry or in the area that they're trying to solve. This idea of um, identifying who the key stakeholders are prior to, you know, identifying the problem or, or, or as part of the, the, the needs analysis and, and understanding the key players. So we introduced the idea of stakeholder mapping or stakeholders and their, their um, motivations. So we can start seeing why we're doing this and direct connection. I yeah. like if, if I can add yes. one more thing, or a couple more things is, you know, asking the questions, right? You know, if you don't ask, you're never gonna get the answer, right? Or, or you're never gonna know, right? It's like, you, you, you gotta know, I, I, I tell my boys, I'm like, hey, listen, you like that girl over there? You wanna go out with her? You gotta ask her, right? You're never gonna know unless you ask. Um, but then to get the answers, it's, you know, people are willing to help you if you ask that question, right? And they're willing to help give you the right answers. And the other thing too, in my line of work is people always think like, oh, you're the consultant, we're paying you 500 bucks an hour, you better have all the answers. And it's like, well, 
I'll have a lot of the answers, but I'm not going to have many answers in some instances because every business is different. And if I don't know exactly how your operating model is, which I've worked for two telecommunication companies that do the exact same thing, but their operating models were completely different. So when they were asking me certain questions at the second place I had gone to, I'm like, well, you got to tell me a little bit about your operating model. So I always tell my teams like, listen, you know, and this kind of goes back to the villain and the hero uh, question as well is, you know, there's the consultants that are out there that'll, that'll bullshit and give you an answer that, you know, they think is right. Um, without actually going and get the information, or maybe they're afraid to actually say, no, I don't have that answer. I think it's okay that you don't have the answer, but what you follow it up with is, hey, you know what? Hey, Jim, Joe, Jane, whoever, that's a great question. I don't know that information off the top of my head. Let me go back and look at the details of the data and get back to you within the next couple hours as to what that answer is. And, and maybe that's correct. Maybe that's where you need to go look, or maybe you got to make 10 phone calls in the next couple hours. But at the end of the day, you're, you're human. We're all human. We don't have the answer, but we're going to go get that for you because that's what you hired us to do. Wonderful. I kind of would like to pivot away from talking about the, the daily and the life of what it is to be a consultant and maybe hear more about your story and how you mm -hmm. came to or through your career path. So I know, like our, my students, mm -hmm. we're at a state school. <laughs> and I know you went to a state school. And yes. you graduated from a state school. And I'm curious to know how you went from being at a state school to becoming the masters of a universe at a top consulting firm. <sighs> and what can we learn from that? And what do we need to do in order to follow that path? Yeah. Uh, great question. I, I think the two things that come to mind is persistence and, and the second piece is hard work. Um, you know, my persistence and how I got into consulting, I was working for a logistics firm. Um, so, you know, you mentioned I've been in the in the in this, you know, for about two decades. Uh, that's because I started work when I was 10. Uh, so in case you're you're wondering how old I am. But anywho, um, Back in 2003, I started working for a logistics firm and they were going in, they were just coming out of bankruptcy. And by the time 2005, 2006 was coming around, they were going back into bankruptcy again. It was just a really horrible environment. Um, but I liked what I did because it was different every day. There was no same script or same story that you did. Um, and so I knew I wanted to stay in that line of work, but I needed to get out. So I just started handing out my resume to anybody and everybody, literally back in, many of you guys might not even know what career builder is. I don't even know if that's still around anymore, but it's a, a site where you can go like in Indeed or um, uh, what's the other um, uh, resume Monster. place? Yeah, Monster, exactly. I was actually on both Monster and career builder back then, putting out like five resumes a day. And I didn't care if it was for rocket scientists. I figured, hey, if Tony's working at the uh, rocket science uh, scientist factory, his next door neighbor might need somebody that's in logistics. And so I just started handing it out. And that's where the persistence was, right? Um, I just didn't give up and I just didn't care at that point. I'm like, I'm going to find what I want and I'm going to send out as many resumes as I can to get out of this place. Um, and then finally, Accenture called me and they said, hey, you know, you filled out two applications, uh, one in distribution, one in transportation. Which one do you want? And I said, whatever gets my foot in the door. I don't care. I got to get out of here. I really am learning more about the consulting industry. And I think this would be a great opportunity for me. So long story short, um, they hired me. I was there for about five years. Um, and f a little uh, fun fact, um, Every quarter, Accenture sends out an email to all the employees to tell you how long you've been at the firm and where you stand in ranking amongst everybody. Um, now, mind you, I was only there for five years, and at that time, Accenture was 300,000 employees. My last email before I left said that 80% of the firm had started after me. So if it gives you any indication on how much of a meat grinder it could be um, or just you know, people that it just comes and goes, right? Um, but going back to what I was saying before and how I kind of got into Accenture and then how I succeeded there was, again, just the hard work. I mean, you know, I remember being there within the first month, being extremely overwhelmed, like all these different policies, procedures that I had to learn. 
And then, you know, I'm working with people from Harvard, University of Michigan, Stanford, you know, big name schools. And here's little Mike Moore with, you know, a degree from Illinois State University, which most people probably don't even know of. Um, but I'm sitting here, what do I got to do to outshine these? Because Accenture is an up or out system. Either you perform or you're out within like literally a year or two. Uh, they, they don't mess around. And so I'm like, well, I got to perform. So I just, I worked my tail off. And I remember at the end of a one project that I had, um, I had my project manager who we're still good friends today. He came up to me and he's like, Mike, listen, you're not a Harvard grad. He goes, you know, but that's okay. And I said, well, where, where's this conversation going? You know, were you telling me and I'm an idiot? Like, tell me something I don't know. Um, and he goes, no, no. He goes, listen, he goes, I've worked with some really smart people. He goes, but I've never worked with anybody that works as hard as you. And he goes, at the end of the day, he goes, I will take that over smarts because he goes, I know you're going to do whatever you need to do to get that, you know, task done and delivered on time for the client. So, you know, just having that mindset of just constantly persistent in, in trying to get to that next level um, and just working hard to get to that next level. One of the biggest challenges that I face and the students face and as they work on projects within the university setting is their deep hatred to work in a group and i see some <laughs> smiles with the student but it's and they sometimes feel that it doesn't really reflect what happens in industry so i, I want to ask you what role does group work play or teamwork play in your industry and, and career and how do we how do we manage that or rectify and, and become an expert in group work yeah teamwork? Well, I mean, we know that individualism is what got us on the moon. If people believe that we went to the moon, um, I'm, I'm joking, by the way. Um, my point with that comment is, is like, listen, we would have never been able to go to the moon without working in groups. Um, I think working in groups is what's got me to where I am today. I mean, there's things that I'm really good at and there's things that I'm absolutely horrible at. And whenever I'm on a project, I know that difference. So if there's something I'm really bad at and there's somebody on our team that's really good at that, they're going to take over that activity in that role. And it's understanding that. And then also, too, you learn so much by working in groups. I mean, I wouldn't have got to where I'm at today or have gotten the experience and knowledge that I've gotten today without leaning on others that have had that experience or have taught me something new. Something as simple as, you know, we talk about data in uh, research earlier. You know, I spend more time than I probably should in Excel every day for work, right? Well, to help expedite my time in Excel, I, you know, because I worked in groups on these projects, I've got, I remember Jason, he would show me like all these shortcuts and how to do, you know, quickly with like three keystrokes, create a pivot table, um, how to be able to do matches and indexing and all of that good stuff that you need to be able to do to analyze data extremely fast and be able to provide that output of the answer that you're looking for. I would have never learned that had I not been in that group atmosphere. Um, all the other experiences that I've gotten, again, I would not be where I'm at today if it wasn't for me being able to learn from others and being able to not only learn, but that's how you get projects done in the time that you're looking to get them done. I mean, every client I go to, you know, we're looking at six, seven week projects. You know, that project where we looked at that manufacturer of appliances from soup to nuts. I mean, their entire, you know, 10 areas of the process, we did that in like eight weeks, not even, it was like seven weeks. There's no way we would have been able to do that with just one person, but we had to be able to meet that because the client's like, I need an answer in seven weeks. So I know where to go fix this. So then I can make those changes make more product, be more efficient, make the customer happy, yada, yada, yada. But again, we would have never been able to do that with just one person. The other thing I think that people don't understand is that working in a team helps you grow internally, not, not just internally, but emotionally as well. There's times I have to swallow my pride and be able to say, hey, you know what, you're right, I'm wrong and move forward. Uh, there's also times too where I know that there's somebody that I'm working with, whether it's on my team or at the client, that I have to figure out the right way to message it to them so that I can get them to do what I want, right? So if I just go in and say, hey, you need to go do this, blah, 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 a lot of times that works for people. But there's other people I have to ask questions to get them to understand 
why I want them to go that route. And then once they understand that, then they're like, oh, that makes sense. Yes, we should go down that path to go get that done. So not only does working in groups help you grow as a person, but it also helps you learn significantly a lot more than you would uh, by yourself. I'd like to highlight two things. One, Mike referred to learning from others. There's a specific reason why I have that peer-to-peer -peer learning in all of the courses, right? In the mm -hmm. creativity and innovation course, you have to post your work publicly to all the other students and then reply because you're learning from others and you're repeating the language and learning the lingo, et cetera. The same thing goes for scalability and student consulting. This is exactly why I have you on the forum to present your research and your, your problem and your presentation and put it publicly so others can watch it and learn from and see the same comments that I get. And then why you're giving a critique back to them as well. So there's a real purposeful reasoning and logic of why I have it structured that way. And it's because of this idea of learning from others, of also getting outside of your comfort zone and kind of seeing that there's a lot of skilled and talented people in our program and, and in USF. You could see who's got talent and, and who's building talent. So thank you, Mike, for sharing of why group work and, and learning from others is important. Uh, yeah, absolutely. There was one, one other point that, oh, one thing that really stood out. So this was an awakening to me, and hopefully the, the students and audience also picked this up. So you're saying you're working on a contract or a project with a client six to eight weeks, and you have to master that industry, you have to master the presentation, you have to master the solution, you have to master everything in that. We, do you know what we call that? We call this almost like a design sprint or uh, mm -hmm. some sort of short, agile. Combustible, agile, combustible period. And guess what? Our courses are more or less structured like that. We, maybe the semester is 15 weeks, but the reality is you only have 10 to 12 weeks to work on our project. For those who are in the scalability and for those who are in the student consulting. This is very much mirroring what Mike just said. You have to get up to speed and become a master and utilize teamwork, research data, whatever, to come to a solution so that client can get some sort of resolution and move, pivot left or right, whatever path they choose from, from the recommendations that they make. So we can very much see that those that time frame is very relevant to what happens in industry. Thank you for enlightening with it and and not suggesting yeah. that what we're doing is some sort of lengthy project that or short project compared to what really happens. But thank you because because yeah. that really shows how powerful what we're doing and how practical it is. I would like to prime the students coming up before I ask this next question um, to think about questions of what. What questions you might have for Mike and where, where can we go from this? I want to kind of riff just a little bit. You work with all these different industries. You work in supply chain, a few different areas. And right now it's real sexy to talk about technology and all these new technology. Mm -hmm. And I just want to get a yes or no answer or thumbs up, thumbs down. If, if we are really worshiping these new technologies that are going to revolutionize or if you see companies using them. So we've had guests on here that talk about blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, people say it could revolutionize different forms of va the value chain or even supply chain. Do you see companies utilizing this now or investing in it or is it going to be something in at least the areas and industries that you've seen? And I'm not asking uh, prediction, but more or less on the ground insights. Yeah, definitely. I can answer all three of those. So it's interesting you brought up blockchain. So um, in our, what I, I sit in our performance improvement group, uh, which is more or less operations and revenue improvement for organizations. And I'm considered our, our blockchain go-to. Um, so I'm working with our technology team, which is a completely different group of the business. Um, but I'm working with them to get more engaged and get clients involved in it. What I can say about blockchain is those three areas that you hit on it, it's exactly all three of those areas. One, people are looking at it. Two, some people are looking at it um, and using it. And then three, it's gonna be huge in the future. And what I can say to that is one is, why some people are only still looking at it is because it's still at the very immature stage of the life cycle. Um, 
companies are still trying to understand exactly what it is. And really, when we go to market with blockchain, we don't even talk about blockchain. We don't even say the word blockchain. We talk about the issues that the client has. And then we'll say, hey, have you thought about solving it this way? And they're like, oh, yeah, that'd be great. Do you, do you know how to fix it with that? And like, yeah, that's actually blockchain. And they're like, well, well what? Blockchain does that? Absolutely. Um, and the reason it's immature is because a lot of people aren't tech savvy enough to really understand all the ins and outs of what blockchain is, how it works and what it can do. There are companies that are using it. We have some very, very successful case studies where, you know, if you're looking at a grocer, uh, you know, up here we have Jewel. I think you guys have Publix down there. Um, if Publix has a bad head of lettuce, a bad batch of lettuce, right, that they got from a, a farmer up in, say, New York, for example, um, what they used to have to do is basically throw out every single batch that they got from that farmer for lettuce, and basically it could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now what they can do is they can pinpoint what actual crate that that head of lettuce was in and basically just test that. Uh, through blockchain, through RFID, and be able to say, hey, instead of throwing out everything we got from that farmer, we only need to throw out two cases of lettuce because that was the only cases that had E. coli. Um, I think, so that, that's one example of a great use case. I think how it's going to be in the future is people don't even, we haven't even touched the surface of what blockchain can actually do. Um, when we, I was just reading something the other day around the complacency of the manufacturing industry, automotive industry, you know, manufacturing and automotive have nowhere near touched anything around blockchain. And those are the two industries or areas where blockchain would be revolutionary for those industries. And if they start to actually implement blockchain, you're going to see costs of cars go down. You're going to see supply chain visibility go up you're going to see massive benefits across the business that they're going to be able to reap and reward, um, but they're just not at that point yet. I also want to make a connection for the students. Mike said, gave, gave a, a short uh, summary of him introducing an idea for a client and the client said, Oh, can it be solved that way? So this is a perfect example where Mike has a certain level of expertise or a certain comfort level with this new technology. A firm who doesn't necessarily have the capabilities, who doesn't know about the technology, who might not have their own R&D unit, who may not have their own innovation team, who may not be mm -hmm. scanning the external environment for other opportunities to improve processes, efficiencies, et cetera. And here we can see where external knowledge can be imported internal to accelerate processes, efficiency, new product services, and whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. um, in one of my classes, we are exploring another technology, and I want your opinion uh, on maybe where it's relevant for the industries that you've dealt with, and then the specialization that you have within supply chain. Uh, we're, we're trying to put it in the context of smart cities, but we expect the students to do some research and find a comfort level of Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. What do you see on the Internet of Things level from your, your vantage point? Yeah, I think that's another area that's, you know, just starting. I think it's a little bit more mature than blockchain. I think if you look at companies like CB Richard Ellis, a large real estate organization uh, that owns tons of commercial buildings across the United States. They're using internet of things to tell them when elevator shafts need to be repaired or, you know, need to be maintained. When HVAC, HVAC you know, heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems need to be fixed and whatnot. So there's that, there's the internet of things where when you provide, when you uh, combine that with blockchain, you know, it's helping um, companies identify for those of you that aren't familiar with shipping vessels, you know, if you hear the stories out there, there's, you know, 20 of them just lined up outside of Long Beach right now because there's such a, a backup of unloading them. But each one of those shipping vessels can hold about a thousand containers, right? And those thousand containers can take two to three days to actually unload off the vessel. Well, if you've got a, ves a, a container that you need to get to right away, you're able to do that through the internet of things and, you know, other technology, maybe it's RFID that are able to help you pinpoint exactly where that's at. It's helping, you know, the cars that you're driving today, 
those cars are relaying information back to the manufacturers and telling them when brakes are going bad, when shocks, you know, parts of that car are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, that all of a sudden triggers a, a notification on, on your screen to say, hey, you need to take this in for engine fix or whatever it is, right? That's all because of internet of things. And so, yes, I think, you know, even in your home, I mean, if anybody has the Nest or, you know, the apps on your phones that can turn on the lights, turn off the lights, turn on your music, et cetera. And that's all internet of things. And I think where it's even expanding, it's, um, uh, forget the name of it, but basically you're not necessarily using, you're not going all the way back to the server for the information. You might be actually going to your neighbor's, you know, internet hotspot that's providing you the the information a lot quicker and really consolidating that latency. Do you have any experience of Internet of Things or working with urb, um, cities trying to be smart or regions trying to be smart? I'm asking because that's part of one of the problems or challenges. And I think when you talked about the shipping, that could be easily a smart dock, smart shipping yard, mm -hmm. smart whatever it's called. But do you have any experience in that? And is there any wisdom that you might have just because we're exploring that within the class? I have experience. I'm not so much. I'm not so much sure about the wisdom, but I can give you an example. Uh, Semper Energy. Um, people might know of Semper Energy as they're the ones that supposedly caused the big fires out in California uh, last year. Um, I worked for them as a client back in 2000. I think it was eight. And back then they were using what they call smart meters. They were starting to implement those. So using Internet of Things smart meters. They're able to have the meter that's connected to your house that tells you how many kilowatts of energy you're using on an hourly or daily basis. Years ago, you guys might be too young to know this or remember this, but you know, when I was younger, there was always the meter guy or the meter gal that walked around to your house and would read the meter, write it down, and then go back and submit it. With the Internet of Things and smart meters, they don't need to do that anymore. That information is live. You don't have to worry about somebody fat fingering a number. So now your electric bill just skyrocketed because somebody wrote down the wrong number of kilowatts that you use for the month. Um, it's all electronic. It's live. It's immediate. Um, so from that aspect, I know a lot of companies by now have started to imp implement the smart meters. Um, even just from understanding... Um, you know, traffic flows in and out of the city. You know, they're using internet of things to be able to identify that. Um, but that's that's the only experience I have with it. So again, nothing, nothing too, uh, you know, um, intelligent about that. <laughs> no, thank you for sharing because we're exploring that as well. And this is part of part of the process when we're trying to learn about innovation, trying to connect technology to urban innovation to solve local sustainable problems or challenges that mm -hmm. the, the Tampa Bay and the Sun Coast is facing. So thank you for sharing that. Uh -huh. I would like to prime and ask one more question to Mike, but then I'm going to open the floor up from the, from the students to Q&A. So I know sometimes they're shy, so I want to give them some, some headway or some leeway at least. Um, but I'm curious to know what skills do future leaders, managers, and employees uh, want or what they're looking for? And what can we do today to help build those skills to make sure that we're walking in with the most up-to-date skills or things that are advantageous in the market that differentiate us and that help us land that glorious job that we're looking for? Is there anything that you're seeing with all the people that you work with? And I know you do, you, you hire interns and you have a process with that. Maybe you could share that as well. But what can we do to build our skills to make sure that we are on a career path that's going to excel? And how can we get ahead and in front of the ball? Yep. Great question. Sorry, I was just writing some of the things that just came top of mind. So first and foremost, listening. Um, listening is the most important thing you can do. And you're probably wondering, like, well, I listen all the time and I guarantee 90 percent of you don't listen nearly as much as you should be doing because there's a difference between listening and hearing. <laughs> um, you know, there's a couple great stories and I won't uh, take up the time to, to talk about them now. If you guys want to talk about them later, like I said, hit me up. But there's two books, What Great Salespeople Do. And then the other book is How to Win Friends and Influence Others. And they have some really good stories in there about what listening can do. And I actually... I actually did that on a, um, a job interview once, and it, it was amazing how well it worked. 
not necessarily just the listening piece, but the other pieces that went along with the listening. Um, so I think listening, right? Active listening, asking questions, right? Not being distracted um, as you're trying to understand what the problems are. Even when you're out with friends or even family, right? Listen to what they're telling you. Don't be looking at your phone, at your, you know, uh, chat snap or Instagram or whatever, you know, the, the technology is out there today that obviously, you know, I'm not part of because I know it's Snapchat, but I was just joking. <laughs> Anywho, um, you know, put those down, listen to what your friends and family are talking about and actively engage with that conversation. That is truly listening, right? If you're sitting there looking at your phone and uh-huh, uh-huh, that's hearing, right? And nobody likes a hearer. They want a listener to understand what their problems are. I think another area is you don't have to be great at finance, but you have to be good at finance. So go understand the basics, right? And I'll tell you right now, I'm the first one to tell you that I sucked at this, right? I failed my first accounting class, right? And I think the only reason I got a D in the second time I took it is because the professor felt bad for me. He's like, this guy's trying so hard, but I just, I couldn't get it, right? But now that I've been doing what I've been doing so long, it just comes naturally to me now. But if you just understand the basics of how to read an income statement and how to read a balance sheet, and you guys have a hell of a lot more technology to figure that out today, because I didn't have Google, or some people I know call the Google. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't have that when I was your age, right? Like to be able to go and just say, okay, how to read a balance sheet? You know, what are the things that should jump out at you? Um, two other things I will touch on is having that analytical mindset of not just kind of, you know, saying yes, okay, it's thinking through the problem and trying to figure out like, okay, somebody's telling me this, but does that make sense, right? Like a lot of times my brother, he, he has a different way of looking at things. Uh, and I, I don't want to, I'll just say it from a political standpoint, and he'll say something to me. And I'm like, that just doesn't make sense. I'm, I'm a neutral guy. I don't care about either the left or the right. So I think that's what makes it better for me, because he'll say something. I'm like, that just doesn't make sense. Let me think through that and analyze that a little bit, right? So don't just jump in at what you hear and think that, oh, this is the right answer, right? Do some of your own homework and analyze it. Be analytical thinking through what might be the right answer or the reason that somebody is doing this or that. And what that analytical piece is tied to Excel. If you can take an Excel class and become very good at Excel by the time you graduate, you're going to be top notch uh, and way above uh, your folks that are you know, competing against you on that job interview. Because right now, I can tell you that who we're hiring for my company, they have to have analytical and Excel skills. And if they don't, they're, they're not going to do well because they're going to spend the first six months trying to figure it out and they're going to fall behind. And then last but not least um, is PowerPoint. Believe it or not, not just because I'm a consultant and I do proposals in PowerPoint, I do project kickoffs in PowerPoint, I do midpoint check-ins in PowerPoint, and I also do our final deliverables in PowerPoint. Now, when I go to my clients and I talk to, I was just on the phone with the client that I had. He's actually up in Aberdeen, Scotland, where I had a project. Um, he's putting stuff together in PowerPoint presentations to present to the board. You know, every time a lot of these large projects and organization come up, somebody doesn't say, hey, I just want to go do this. I'm going to go do it. Right. It, a lot of times these, you know, massive projects that take six to eight weeks, 12 weeks and take a team of people. There has to be a business case that you have to develop. Well, how is the business case being presented to the board or the C-suite? It's all via, via PowerPoint. And I can tell you one thing that I hate about PowerPoint is that 90% of my time in PowerPoint is formatting. <laughs> I, can put, I can build a proposal, which I had to do on Sunday. I spent six hours building the proposal. I probably built the proposal in an hour and a half. The other four and a half hours was just the damn formatting. <laughs> Wonderful. So you talked about active listening, Excel, um, PowerPoint, and I think there was one more. Finance. Finance. That's right. So it, my students get tired of me saying, make the presentation. They're using the slide deck. They're, they're like, well, I already did that. I already did that. I already did that. This is why you have to become obsessed. And this is why as a consultant, and I would even say within industry, you have to master that work, regardless if you're spending four hours on formatting or whatever. And it, it, Mike is an expert in these areas. So if it takes him six hours to create a proposal, that could be like 
36 to 48 to 50 hours for us to do anything not even as remotely as good. You see where I'm going with this. This, these are your tools. These are your superpowers when you're meeting and kicking off or persuading, et cetera. So this is why I'm driving that down your throats and why you have to iteratively constantly practice that slide deck, that presentation, that proposal to make it logical, to support it with research, to support it with data. We also do active listening, not always or directly in our courses. I do teach a course called Improv for Business. And one of the tools, like a good improv artist, is this idea of active listening. And we go through exercises to be a better listener because I think, and I agree with you, Mike, we don't, we're not trained or taught. It's something mm -hmm. that we, we put off and it, it could help us in many aspects of our, our careers. Yeah. And then, yeah, uh, jump just, in. you jumped on to a point there around, you know, kind of, you know, hey, if it takes Mike six hours, it's probably going to take us 40 or 50 hours. Well, the only way you get good at it to get it down to that six hours is practice. And there's a good book. If you guys haven't read it, it's called Outliers. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell, he's got a couple good books out there. Outliers is a great one. He talks about the 10,000 hour rule. And basically what it means is anybody that's a professional, it takes 10,000 hours to get that title of a professional. And it, it tells a little story about the Beatles. So for those of you that know who the Beatles are, when they first started, they were playing in small dive bars in Berlin. They did that for like five years before they actually became successful. And so the whole point with that is, is when they, he actually started to do the math, he's like, they got in roughly 10,000 hours of playtime within those dive bars of Berlin over those five years before they actually made it big. So my point with that is, is that you got to put those hours in and work hard in order to shrink that level of time it takes for you to do something and be really good at it. Wonderful example. One thing that I've pushed the students, at least for this open educator forum, is this is part of the practice. This is a part of professionalizing the student experience, professionalize our learning. While we might not have school to go to because it's whatever, because of the virus, we might not have work because of work has changed, but we're trying to professionalize our career and learn, and we're doing that on a weekly basis with our, our hour. And I tell and I challenge the students, do you want to be more like prepared and practice like Michael Jordan or do you want mm -hmm. to practice like a Dennis Rodman? And this is why we come every week. This is why we're putting those hours in so we can become an expert and improve iteratively and tie it back to your finance part. Right. You didn't yeah. become an expert or as good as you did with finance. It was iteratively. You learn over time, but you mm -hmm. have to put the hours in. So these are wonderful connections we're making. Uh, I would like to turn over the floor to the students to ask a few questions. If I'm confident Mike has has answers, and if not, we'll we'll direct us to uh, where we can find answers within ourselves or supportive knowledge and information. So I'd like to open the floor to questions that I see one question at hand raised. Uh, Sienna, Ethan? can you? Ethan. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Mike. So I was wondering, you talked about your experience going from uh, college into consulting, but how how and when did you find out that, you know, consulting was what you wanted to do? Yeah, great question. So when I graduated college, actually, I, I went into work for a logistics firm, as I was mentioning, and um, worked in what we call industry. So if you're ever in a consult, if you work as a consultant, there's two worlds. There's the industry and there's consulting. So anything outside of consulting is considered industry. So I worked in industry for about three years. Once I got into consulting, it was probably the first year I sat back and I was like, holy cow. In that last year, I learned more in the first three years of my last company or the total three years of my last company. At that point is when I knew I, I, I'm going to be a consultant for the rest of my life because one, I like change. I can't do, I can't be the accountant that's closing the books every single month. Like my next door neighbor, great guy. Mike's a great guy but he closes the books every month because he's a, an accountant. I couldn't do that. I'd shoot myself if that was the type of job that I had to live in. Um, I like the change. I like the people I get to meet, the experiences. I've been all over the world. I've been to Sydney, Australia, Paris, France. I've been to London 12 times. I've been to Manchester, England, been to Aberdeen, Scotland, Mexico City. Uh, I've been to 20 of uh, the states in the United States all through work. 
not only have I met great people, I've had great experiences, built great relationships and friendships through all of that. And, you know, granted that was over time, but within that first year of Accenture, I traveled to like three different states and had three different projects. And I was just like, holy shit, this is great. I'm learning so much and doing different stuff every day that it allows me to, you know, this is why I get a, get out of bed. Thank you. No problem. What other questions might you have from Mike? Okay, well, I have a question. Hello. Hello. So looking back at your first year of consulting, what would you have done differently? Yeah, I think for me, it was more around the uh, little bit of the analysis paralysis. Um, I was looking at everything and anything and without really focusing in on where do I want to make my career go. Part of that was because I didn't have a really good career counselor that helped guided me with that. Um, but really try to figure out where should I be focusing? And you could turn it back and say that was my fault for not asking those questions and, and really um, trying to reach out and get the help and support I probably could have used. I think the other thing is to be more confident in myself. Um, I think at times I was you know, working, I, I felt, like I said, overwhelmed and like, oh my God, I'm working with such smart people. Listen, I, I know a lot of smart people that, you know, really, really smart. But at the end of the day, you know, I got a cousin. He, he skipped three years of high school because he basically went from freshman to senior year. Smart as, you know, ta sharp as a tack. But he's working in a factory now, which, hey, that's great for him. He likes it. He likes the nine to five. And it's like, this is all I want to do. But the guy could have probably been a hell of a lot more successful if he wanted to be, but he just didn't have that drive to say, hey, I want to go to school and to college and, and be in business or whatever it is, start my own business. Okay, good points brought up. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. This idea of believing in yourselves. I'm, one thing, the entrepreneurship program I mentioned in the beginning opening was defining careers and empowering students to, to create the journey that they want. So I, I appreciate you sharing that idea of, of having confidence in yourself and cons consistently building that. And you do that through practice. You do that through self-reflection. That's why we have journaling. That's why mm -hmm. we get feedback from others. That's why we practice what we do. I see a couple more hands up. Adriana. Hi, Mike. Hello. So I have a question. Um, you talk about how when you first started, you were working amongst people who like graduated from Harvard and maybe they had more of like a resume, like a bigger resume than you did. I'm mm -hmm. wondering how you like work the politics of being in that environment. And like, you know, when people work hard, you have to also show the right people that you are working hard. You can't just work yeah. hard and not get that recognition. How did you go about that? Yeah, so great question. So one, I had about three years experience within the logistics space going into, you know, Accenture. So that helped me where, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how book smart you are if you know the process, right? Um, the book smarts will help you with kind of getting things done a little bit faster. Um, I, I think, you know, just having that experience is what was helpful. I think, you know, working the politics as you uh, brought up, which is a great point because it, it can be very political, not only in just in the consulting world, but even at, you know, industry level. Um, but for me, even at my level, I'm constantly reaching out and making sure people know what I'm doing, right? My boss, I tell him, hey, this is what I'm working on, right? He doesn't micromanage me. He doesn't need to micromanage me. If he micromanages me, I'll be out the door in a heartbeat. Um, but he knows that, hey, I'm constantly doing stuff. And he's, he knows that. And the reason why he doesn't have to micromanage is because I'm constantly keeping him in the loop on that. Um, there was one other point I was going to bring up around uh, the politics in oh networking so you know talking about visibility you know i network constantly through my own company and through people that i'm trying to do sales with you know and i really encourage every single one of you on the call today the people that you're studying with today that you're friends with today if you go into consulting and you need to sell something they might be the buyer on the other end 20 years from now so what you do today from a networking standpoint, building those relationships, building those friendships um, is very important. So networking and the visibility is very, very key in that aspect. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, also Reem has a question. Sure. 
Yeah, hi, Mark. Hello. Um, I'm working in a research of encapsulating of perf and wax in concrete. And I already did so many steps in that. I started from the scratch. I found the raw materials, economics, and everything. And mm -hmm. now I'm um, in my last step of doing the PowerPoint. And I was wondering if, like, you can tell me what are the main important things to add for, like, whatever project. Because um, I, was, I was just, you know, it's a huge project and it has so many things. And I was just confused in what are the main things that I can include in my PowerPoint. Yeah, so good question. And I, I don't know if this can answer it completely, um, but I'll do my best. Whenever I create a PowerPoint, um, I create what I call a storyboard. So I'll create, I'll write down, you know, five or six bullets on a piece of paper. And then I take those bullet points and I put them as the header for each individual slide. So if I got six bullet points, I got six different slides and I put the header. If it's, you know, hey, Here's, you know, understanding of your needs, right? So I'll just go through an example of a proposal that I put together. First slide is going to be, you know, understanding of your needs, client. And I'll put down all that I know about what their issues are and what they're trying to solve and what their end goal is. Then the next slide is going to be, okay, well, how do I get there? What's my approach? So here's your issue. How do I solve it? What's going to be my approach to do that? So then putting in the approach. Then looking at saying, okay, well, what is the team structure going to be to help solve that problem, right? To do that approach. How much is that going to cost? And then lastly, what is the expertise and experience on why you would want to hire us? So I think, Reen, to your question, um, a lot of it is, is building that storyboard and understanding what do you want to present to the client or the individual that you're presenting to as to what are they asking to get out of this presentation, right? Are they looking just to understand what's going on in the concrete industry? Okay, then let's tell them, hey, here's what's happened over the last several years uh, within the industry. What are the three or four things that are very important in concrete, right? Sand uh, or gravel, whatever it is. Tell them what's going on with the prices of those materials over the last three to four years and what it's forecasted to be over the next two to three years. And then wrap it up with, okay, here, we told you a little bit about the industry. Here's, you know, what's going on with the pricing. Maybe it's a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to be able to either uh, be a business or barriers to entry, right? Pulling that together and then wrapping it up in some type of summary. And going back to what I was talking about in the proposals, a lot of times we'll have like a summary slide that says, okay, here, you know, when you, when you write, a, write a report, right? You've always been taught and maybe you haven't. It took me a while before I actually was taught this, but it was tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them. So you got your intro, your body and your summary. And that's the exact same way you should be writing a PowerPoint presentation. The difference between PowerPoint and a Word document, most people are visually orientated. So when you create a PowerPoint presentation, please don't put a thousand words on a page. I know people in my industry that still do that, and it drives me absolutely nuts. They try to, you know, we call every piece of white space on their real estate, and they try to fill up every single piece of real estate on that page to tell the answer. I've had clients come back to me and be like, you've got a thousand words on that page. Like, I, it's going to take me two days just to read all that and, and regret, you know, understand it, you know, so please just use more of a, a representation of what you're trying to say through visual um, aids, symbols, et cetera. Thank you so much. No problem. Mike, I, I loved all that you shared because one tool that we learn about in design thinking is about storyboarding. This also mm -hmm. talks about the importance of storytelling of the data, of your pitch. Um, it's an importance in terms of, of selling, in terms of innovation, et cetera. So I love that you, you shared all of that and the importance of visuals. Uh, and we are working through those. Some of us have... Uh, have mastered that, some of us are continuing to improve. So we see why mm -hmm. we're doing that in the classroom and how it translates to industry. This has been wonderful. Mm -hmm. I have one last question that I ask all my guests. And if you could go back and give your younger self some advice, what would you say to him? Yeah, so good question. Um, I've never been big on reading, um, but I read more now than I ever have in my life. Um, not just because of COVID, but because I realized the importance of it. 
So I would tell myself one, um, do more reading and reading in general on a couple of things, one on biographies. So, you know, read, read the biography of Abraham Lincoln, some really good stuff in there. Um, read about, you know, self-help books. Like I was talking about like, you know, what great salespeople do, how to win friends and influence others. Uh, seven habits of highly effective people is another good one. Um, but do some more reading. Um, that's going to help you not only expand your mindset, but also give you more, more knowledge overall, um, and then help you be more confident as you, as you grow into, into your career. Um, I obviously study a little bit more. Um, I think I'm doing pretty well for myself, but you know, if I would have studied a little bit more, maybe I'd be a couple years more advanced where I'm at today, who knows? Um, but you know, listen, go have your fun. I remember what it was like in college. Enjoy, right? Because once you get out of college, it's, it's hard to go back and, and, and have the, the non-responsibilities that you might have today. Um, but still, maybe, maybe take an extra 15, 20 minutes a day to get some extra study and then it'll pay off in the long run. You know, my mom used to always tell me, work hard now so you can play later. Well, I'm working hard now, but I played before. So I, I did it backwards and now I'm kind of kicking myself in the butt. Um, so, and I think just, you know, get out there and be social, you know, meet people, talk to people, understand, want to learn more. You know, what drives me nuts today about the younger generation is that, you know, we get the, the, the younger kids coming into our company and it's like, they'll, they'll email or Insta, uh, not Instagram, uh, uh, chat with somebody via getting up and going over to their desk. They'll be two desks away. And I'm like, what are you doing? I get up, go talk, build those skills and work on it now, because the more you work on it now, the more better you're going to be. And at the end of the day, the people that are typically more successful are the ones that can go talk and have those conversations and are very uh, comfortable with themselves. So wonderful, I, wonderful yeah. advice, Mike. Um, your music to my ears when you were saying study more, learn more, spend time and focus on that. I, I, I get tired sometimes of saying that. So you're, 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 I, I could feel it. Thank you. Well, you told me to say all three of those, right? Cause you're going to give me a hundred dollars. <laughs> hey, I'll give you an A in the class. I'll give you an A. You want to study some more. There you go. Uh, Mike, thank you for sharing and spending the morning with us, sharing your wisdom, your experience, your story, invaluable. We'll circle back and double back to talk more and, and catch up some yeah. more. But let's give Mike a big round of applause and thank you again. No, thank you guys so much for your time. Like I said, if anybody has any questions and wants to reach out, feel free to. Um, I'm very passionate about stuff like this, so I'm glad to help. And if there's any other uh, sessions you'd like me to participate, please let me know. I'd be happy to do so. Great. Thank you. Wish you the best. Be in touch soon. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Good luck and uh, have a great rest of the day. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, everyone.